Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Construction Project Management Tips. Today we're going to be looking at the eight areas of waste. This is number four in the series and we're going to be focusing in on non-utilized talent. I'm a professor of construction management and if you're new to the channel and you want to learn a lot more about construction management and construction in general, please click subscribe, check out my playlists. I have courses that are posted online based on a number of different videos and you can just follow the playlist for whatever or wherever your interests take you. All right, so let's get started. So we're looking at the eight areas of waste. Now we've looked at in previous videos, defects, overproduction, waiting, and today we're gonna to be looking at non-utilized talent. The way you can kind of break this down, of course, this is the eight areas of waste, which is part of lean construction, which is pulled out of lean manufacturing methodologies. And it spells the word downtime. That's the easy way to kind of remember these eight areas of waste. And what we're trying to do is get you to be more mindful when you walk around a construction site and you see waste, it just sort of hits you and you recognize it and then you're able to attack it because there is a lot of waste in construction. And today's topic, non-utilized talent, is an area where unfortunately we have a lot of that in construction. We have a lot of valuable people, tradespeople that have a lot of expertise four persons that have really good knowledge of how long something should take, some of the issues that might trip up the project and cause delays. And we have to make sure that we're utilizing that great talent that we have in our workforce. And so basically, if we want to define this, you know, not taking advantage of the knowledge and skills of people involved in your project. This is kind of universal, but I feel like because we're so fragmented as an industry, meaning we have so many different trades, companies, vendors, etc., coming together for a project. I think it's even more accentuated in construction than other sectors. Uh, so really what this waste leads to is a number of things, as you'll see as I go along. But really, uh, you know, if you're looking at it from a business point of view, opportunities for innovation and productivity, these are really exposed when we haven't utilized the talents of the people involved in our projects. Now, people are often surprised when you sort of throw out a number, you know, how do we measure waste in construction? There's a number of different ways that waste is measured. Uh, it can be broken into two essential kind of, or two areas, if you will. There's what we call non-value added waste and there's essential non-value added waste. So non-value added waste, that's just pure waste. That's just like, it's just going in the dumpster and it's wasted. And it doesn't have to be physical. It could be the waste of a talent as well. Uh, when we talk about essential non-value added waste, that's kind of like, project management. That is, as an example, our schedules. The client doesn't care about our schedules when we're done. They care that you finished on time and they have the building that they can use or the road that can be used or the bridge that can be used or the house that can be occupied. All the stuff that goes into making that happen from a planning, scheduling, uh, project management perspective, or even an architectural perspective, the drawings, permits, all of that, they don't care about, they want the end product. Uh, that one, you know, we can work on for sure. And we're going to work on it. You know, in my videos, I go through a lot of the elements of how to do that more efficiently. And we'll talk about that today as well. But the one that really is like, you know, accentuated there, which is around 35%. There's a lot of research out there by a lot of different entities, and they're in that 30 to 40% zone for uh, what we talk, call non-value added uh, waste and pure waste, right? So that's just pure, um, pure waste. And value added is we actually got the building. Then that's that's the good stuff. That's the physical components. That's the curtain walls. That's basically your concrete uh, floor slabs, your columns, your shear walls. That's your kitchens. That's your elevators. That's the product that we need at the end of the day. But non-utilized talent, right? So th these are all the people that we have involved in our projects. So what's the cost of 
non-utilized talent of basically not really engaging with people. Well, number one, there's a cost that if people don't feel valued, they feel left out. And if they feel left out, they don't engage. So that's a big one. Uh, if you are not really sort of tapping expertise, people feel their own expertise is wasted and they, it kind of saddens them in a lot of ways, right? And if they're not really engaged in their work, they really don't care about their work. And so they're probably not going to stay that long because they're not really, you know, happy with what they're doing. They feel that they're not um, taking advantage of the skill sets that they've worked hard and creativity and the ideas that they may have. Um, so you have a big loss of potential improvements and innovations. And in industry, the way the world is changing so fast and in construction is changing really fast. If we're not innovating and we're not being creative, we're falling behind. And in construction, there's so many problems and issues that come up. You want to have people that are participating that are innovative and creative, and you don't want that to be just left silenced and not utilized. That's a big waste. You can kind of see how that translates. Sometimes it's hard to measure this particular one. Some of the eight areas of waste is like, so you can put dollars to every single thing very easily. Uh, you'll see in motion coming up how you can put dollars um, to it. But you're utilizing your talent. You can just sort of, you can picture that waste, right? Somebody had the idea that could have saved you all of this rework going back a few videos, right? That's a big deal. That's a big deal. And or somebody has an idea that would prevent it from happening again. So, you know, one example, a site team meeting where there is a real problem with sequencing and scheduling. And one of the workers, they have that solution, but they keep quiet about it. Why do they keep quiet about it? Well, that's the next thing. So you got to ask yourself, well, what's going on? Why do they keep quiet about it? Right? Um, so basically, as we said, not taking advantage, Oops, I went the wrong way there. Uh, fear of bullying, all right? Fear of bullying, that would be one. Maybe there's been some past history where somebody speaks up and somebody says it's a ridiculous or it's a crazy idea. Um, the new CEO, not new anymore, but um, basically uh, uh, when he took over for Microsoft a number of years back, one of the things that he saw in meetings was somebody would say, oh, that's, a, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. And people would be a little bit fearful of coming up with ideas. And so one of the first things he did was to change that, to work at changing that sort of culture that had built up where somebody would just sort of make something that shouldn't be personal, personal. And then that would keep people sort of in their shell. They wouldn't engage, right? Well, that stuff happens. Sometimes it happens very subliminally. It's not just such a standout, but there's certain little comments that are inferred or made, and then that makes people not want to participate. And so that's that's something we have to think about, right? Uh, or the systems, how we meet or what we do isn't really supporting that input. You know, you can do a lot of stuff online with Zoom meetings and team meetings, etc. But I don't think you can do it very well if people have their cameras off, right? I don't think people are doing other things if they're at those kind of meetings. And so they're not really engaging. Uh, in person, it's a little harder to do that. Uh, sometimes uh, how you structure meetings so that basically people aren't glued to the habits of the cell phone. Figuring out ways and having systems and building a culture of participation is important. Um, not taking time to learn about each other's skills and strengths right? We're just rushing through things. And often we don't see that somebody had a really good skill set that you didn't even know about because you didn't take the time. I remember years back when I was director at my college and I was, uh, you know, doing some professional development uh, meetings with the faculty. Uh, one of the faculty who taught in our HVAC area, uh, I found out was a certified electrician. And I actually found out that they had done minimal amount of HVAC work, enough to get certified, but they had had like 15 years as a certified electrician and they really enjoyed electrical work more than HVAC, but they've been hired in HVAC. That's a non-utilized talent. How do I utilize that? Well, I'm hiring a electrical faculty member. I asked him, would he prefer that position than the one he did, was currently doing in HVAC? And he said, absolutely. And so he very quickly switched over to electrical. 
That's a perfect example because I had to hire somebody. So instead I hire an HVAC faculty, but I've got people better aligned with their skill set, and then they're more engaged and happy at what they're doing. I'd much prefer to have a faculty member that is teaching something they love than something that's just been put upon them because they're capable of teaching it, right? And the same thing goes with trades. You know, they have a lot of talents that you may not be aware of. And if you don't really sort of figure some of those things out, you're missing those opportunities, right? So how do we do that and do that effectively? We come up with ways and means in our systems. Poor communication between departments. Sometimes we're so siloed, we're not communicating across our different departments. And so how do we do that a little bit better? We can build cross-functional teams. We can make sure that uh, in those cross-functional teams, we have certain projects. So we have different inputs and different viewpoints from the different departments so that we're not just going ahead for the benefit of one department at the detriment of the others. That often happens, you know, in manufacturing with sales as opposed to manufacturing. You're selling something you can't manufacture in that time period. Construction, we're selling something we actually can't build and we're making promises we can't keep. And then that leads to dissatisfied uh, clients in the long term. And so there's the short game and the long game that we have to keep in mind in construction. Yes, we want to have more projects, but we don't want to sacrifice a very valuable client because we didn't keep our promises and then they don't want to work with us in the future. And that could have been 10x whatever this one project is right so we have to keep those things in mind and the kind of structures and barriers that might be preventing knowledge sharing and how do we tear those down uh, misalignment between employee skills and job roles as i said like the electrical faculty that would be a good example of that so some strategies to utilize talent well we can develop systems that help us to collaborate so like last planner system in lean construction. It really kind of gets people together, gets people talking, gets people discussing things, gets people looking at the sequencing, gets stronger commitments, gets more engagement with the people instead of sort of a top-down sort of autocratic, this is the schedule and it's come from high above and this is what we have to keep to. This is much more collaborative and iterative and problem solving. And so you look at different systems. How can we create this without it even being forced on anybody? It's just part of the system and it makes it easy. So if we can make something more effortless, that's what we want to do. And that helps us in implementing continuous improvement programs. There's a whole bunch of different continuous improvement programs um, that we can institute like Kaizen events where we bring together people from different departments, breaking down those silos to solve a systemic problem we have within the company that if we solve it, it can mean us catapulting ourselves a few levels up from wherever we are, from a productivity, from a client retention, from a better engagement point of view. Um, brainstorming sessions where we actually have people collaborate and make sure that people's ideas come out. Brainstorming sessions can be done in different ways. And uh, I'll do another video. I did one before if you look on my playlist on brainstorming. But one of the things that you want to do is you want to get people thinking about an idea before they come to the session. So they have a bunch of ideas they can bring forward. So you let that out ahead of time. And when you're in the session, you do like a round table where everybody presents their ideas and you keep going around and around and around until you've exhausted all the ideas. Because sometimes if you just do an open brainstorming session, the extrovert comes out and kind of takes over the meeting. And that's not what you want. You want to make sure too, different personality types. Some people are more introverted. That's non-utilized talent because very often the introverted person is very knowledgeable on something. If we don't figure a way to engage them, we lose that opportunity forever. And so we want to make sure that our systems and the way we conduct our meetings, that we do it in such a way that we're engaging those people. Whether if you know somebody's a little bit more quiet, maybe you tell them ahead of the meeting, you know, I want to I want to tap you about this during the meeting because I know you have a really good insight on this, right? And that usually works really good. You got to figure different ways for different personality types. Um, how you do that. And, you know, last planner system, like I said, if you're doing like a 
pull planning session or make ready sessions, or as the next bullet indicates, like daily stand-ups where you're actually getting input from it. You're trying to get that engagement going as part of the systems. The systems makes it happen. The systems makes it easier to do, right? And that helps, you know, as a leader, you're trying to uh, create a culture that values employees' input. How do we value that employee input? And that will create high, high functioning teams. And the other aspect is we can bring in mentorship and coaching within the company as well that will help to engage people. And it's not forcing mentorship and coaching. You gotta be a little bit careful of that. Some people, it's just not their thing. But it is trying to foster that wherever possible. And there's some people that they're really good at it. So how do we reward those people for spending that extra time and effort doing that? Because then it costs them in time and effort of doing something else. So we want to make sure that we're utilizing that talent for those that are really good at mentoring and coaching as well. Also aligning talent with assignments with strategic goals. Kind of like the electrical example with the professor I said in HVAC to electrical but it could be that you've got somebody that you know within your company that is really good on or really interested in um, climate related issues and energy efficiency and energy modeling making sure that person if you've got sort of a a lead project lead could be leadership and energy efficient design lead certification that you've got that person aligned in that because that's where their interests are as opposed to putting somebody that's maybe not in that kind of alignment so much it's not so much their interest that's a lost opportunity if we didn't align the talent with the strategic goals of what we're trying to accomplish and so you know really when we think about the benefits there's a lot right? This is just one of these eight areas of waste, but the eight areas of waste, they're not mutually exclusive. They're inter interwoven, right? Uh, very often one pops up and causes two or three or four of the other wastes. So one of the benefits is we'll have improved efficiency and reduced costs. We'll have higher satisfaction rates. We have higher satisfaction rates. We have higher retention rates. It takes a lot to hire and onboard new people and to hire the best people. But if we do, one thing we should make sure of is that we retain them, right? We don't want to lose them to the competition because we didn't make them feel valued while they were working with us. Uh, And this will feed itself into innovation and creativity. As I said in the beginning, the world is changing really fast. If you're not changing, you're falling behind. This is one of the areas that we can work in, that you can work on as a leader to help your teams catapult above and beyond the competition, right? Not be a laggard, not be falling behind. And it, you're going to have less stress. So the, the advantages are you as a leader have less stress. People on your teams have less stress. Uh, You don't have people that are just trying to free ride and not do anything uh, because they became disengaged because of cultural issues, because of they weren't, you weren't inclusive enough. And so what happens is the problem becomes the problem, not the people. And this is after Edwards Deming, one of his 14 points. You want to make basically the problem the problem, not the people the problem. That is part of building strong, resilient, engaged teams. So I hope you've enjoyed this session. If you have, please make sure that you uh, click like, uh, that you give a a comment, or if you have any examples that you would like to provide, uh, put them in the comments. And it really helps me to build this community if you subscribe to the channel. So I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we will see you in the next video which is going to be on transportation. Bye for now and we'll see you next time.